Hello everyone. I welcome you all to the third part of the lecture on the famous short story by Edgar Allan Poe, The Purloin Letter. In the last two lectures, we have covered the background of the story and the writer as well. And in the last part, we had just begun the story. Continuing on. Moving on, we have just learned uh, in the last lecture what the case of the Purloin Letter was all about how the client, who was an important personage from a royal family, had approached the prefect, Monsieur G. And Monsieur G. had uh, approached Dupin in order to seek a kind of consultancy from him. Monsieur G. tells about the whole case and Dupin says, than whom? The lady had approached the prefect and uh, Dupin tries to flatter him that who else could she have approached? Amid a perfect whirlwind of smoke, <clears throat> no more sagacious agent could, I suppose, be desired or even imagined. So the client considered Monsieur G to be a person who is very sagacious. The meaning of the word sagacious is a person with a very good judgment. So basically Dupin tries to flatter the prefect. You flatter me, replied the prefect, but it is possible that some such opinion may have been entertained so he accepts the compliment it is clear said i as you observe that the letter is still in possession of the minister since it is this possession and not any employment or use of the letter which bestows the power gives the power <coughs> with the employment the power departs now if uh, the minister decides to use the letter meaning that if he decides to uh, take the letter to the husband the power which the minister is currently having over that royal lady would go away. So what he was doing was that possession of the letter in the hands of Minister D was much more important than the use of the letter in exposing the lady. Because by possessing that letter and keeping that secret close to his heart, uh, the minister was able to blackmail the lady into doing certain things which she was not very comfortable doing. True, said G. <clears throat> and upon uh, this conviction, I proceeded. My first care was to make thorough search of the minister's hotel, the place where he was staying, and here my chief embarrassment lay in the necessity of searching without his knowledge. Beyond all things, I have been warned of the danger which would result from giving him reason to suspect our design. So, Monsieur G had to uh, follow the case and uh, he did not have a search warrant for Monsieur G because they could not put any kind of blame on him because that would ruin the plot. So what Monsieur G says is that uh, they were trying to look for the letter in possession with uh, the Minister D and they were trying uh, to look for the letter without his knowledge. So in his absence, they were trying to search his hotel. The problem over here was that he had been warned of the danger, meaning if Minister D comes to know of the plan or design of the prefect of the Paris, uh, Paris police, he would be in danger. But, said I, you are quite of it in these investigations. Now, the meaning of the word of it is nothing but a person who has a good or a detailed knowledge of things. He's very thorough. The Parisian police have done this thing often before. And the narrator knows that the Parisian police have been known to search people's properties or, or places of living without their knowledge before as well. Oh yes, and for this reason I did not despair. Uh, the prefect does not uh, say no to this. He accepts what the narrator is trying to say and he agrees that they have done this in the past and this was the reason of hope for him. He did not despair. The habits of the minister gave me too a great advantage. <coughs> he is frequently absent from home all night. So the minister's uh, daily routine was quite apt for the prefect to go and search his hotel. His servants are by no means numerous, very few servants. They sleep at a distance from the master's apartment and being chiefly Neapolitans. Neapolitans are uh, people from or the natives of Naples and they are known for drinking habit. So they are readily made drunk. 
I have keys, as you know, with which I can open any chamber or cabinet in Paris. So there was some kind of a master key uh, with which uh, one can open any lock. For three months, a night has not passed during the greater part of which I have not been engaged personally in ransacking. Ransacking is nothing but searching very thoroughly the D Hotel or the residence of the Minister D. My honour is interested and to mention a great secret, the reward is enormous. So there are two important things that he mentions. <clears throat> Sorry, three important things. Firstly, that they are searching uh, the apartment of Minister D without his knowledge, uh, kind of illegally going behind his back. The second thing that he says is that it's been almost three months that they have been looking for this letter. So Dupin had been approached by the prefect after they had been unsuccessful in finding the letter for a period of three months and the third thing is that there was a kind of an enormous money involved the client had promised uh, a great sum of money to the prefect if he is able to find the letter so i did not abandon search until i had become fully satisfied that the thief is no more astute than myself I fancy that I have investigated every nook and corner of the premises in which it is possible that the paper can be concealed. So, uh, the prefect tells Dupin what was uh, his way of looking for the letter. Uh, he had looked into every nook and every crevice of that apartment in which the minister D used to live, but he was still unable to find the letter. But is it not possible, I suggested, that although the letter may be in possession of the minister, as it unquestionably is, he may have concealed it elsewhere than upon his own premises. So the narrator makes a suggestion uh, that it might be possible that you are looking in the wrong place and he must have hidden the letter in some place other than his own premises or his place of living. This is barely possible, said Dupin. The present peculiar condition of affairs at court and especially of those intrigues in which D or Minister D is known to be involved would render the instant availability of the document, its susceptibility of being produced at a moment's notice, a point of nearly equal importance with its possession. So basically the letter holder's power dependent, depended uh, on his choice of producing uh, the letter at a moment's notice or to destroy it at a moment's notice. Uh, its susceptibility of being produced, said I, the narrator was a bit confused, Dupin explains that is to say of being destroyed. Like if the minister finds himself to be framed, uh, it should be in possession of the minister to destroy it as soon as possible. So he gets out of the case without any blame. True, I observed, the paper is clearly then upon the premises. So it was very obvious that the minister uh, did not have any other choice but to keep it very close to him. As for it, its being upon the person of the minister, we may consider that as out of the question. Now, the narrator also assumes that the minister was not carrying the letter with him and the prefect admits that the police have already stopped and searched him. So it was not that the minister was carrying the letter in his pocket, otherwise the police would have found it a long time back. Entirely, said the prefect, he has been twice waylaid, meaning he has been stopped twice for a physical search, uh, as if by footpaths, and this person rigorously searched under my own inspection. So under the inspection of the prefect, he had been searched thoroughly, but no letter had been found on him. You might have spared yourself this trouble, said Dupin. D, referring to the minister D, I presume is not altogether a fool, and if not, must have anticipated these waylayings as a matter of course. So uh, Dubin thinks that uh, the prefect should have known that the minister would be too clever not to expect to be stopped and searched. And uh, this is what had actually happened. The minister had anticipated, he already knew that he was going to be searched and as a result, uh, the prefect never gets a letter on Minister D. Not altogether a fool, said G, but then he is a poet, which I take to be only one remove from a fool. Now, this is the first mistake that the prefect had done. The prefect says that though the minister is not a fool, he is a poet, 
which is a very similar thing meaning fools and poets are the same and uh, what a uh, mistake the prefect had committed was that he had underestimated his enemy okay he had underestimated uh, the cleverness or the sharp mind of minister d this was the reason he was unable to solve the case and we'll get to learn about this later on in the story true said dupin after a long and thoughtful whiff from his meerschaum although i have been guilty of certain doggerel myself so dupin over here accepts or admits that he too is a bit of a poet so that shuts the prefect up suppose you detail said i the particulars of your search so the narrator was interested to know what exactly was the method uh, you know used or employed by the prefect he talks about uh, the kind of search that he had done but it only reveals the uncreative mind that the prefect had the prefect answers why the fact is we took our time and we searched everywhere i have had long experience in these affairs i took the entire building room by room so they are very thorough taking each and every room devoting the nights of a whole week to each so 3 months it had taken for them to go through the whole house the apartment but nothing uh, had uh, uh, you know been fruitful we examined first the furniture of each apartment we opened every possible drawer and i presume you know that to a properly trained police agent such a thing as a secret drawer is impossible they were quite experienced the people who were searching the apartment any man is a dolt a dolt is nothing but a fool any man is a dolt who permits a secret drawer to escape him in a search of this kind the thing is so plain there is a certain amount of bulk or space to be accounted for in every cabinet so in every cabinet there needs to be a certain amount of weight if you find anything to be hollow then there is a secret cabinet then we have accurate rules the 50th part of a line could not escape us they were very uh, minute regarding their searchings after the cabinets we took the chairs the cushions we probed with fine long needles you have seen me employ or use from the tables we removed the tops so he had been very thorough in his search he gives a long description of the way that they had done the search why so the narrator was intrigued as to why they had to remove the table tops sometimes the top of a table or other similarly arranged piece of furniture is removed by the person wishing to conceal an article then the leg is excavated the article deposited within the cavity and the top replaced the bottoms of uh, bottoms and tops of bed posts are employed in the same way so they had uh, assumed that maybe he could have hidden that letter in the hollow cavity of the leg of the table and they had searched even that but could not the cavity be detected by sounding i asked so the narrator was smart enough that if they would have looked for a sound or a hollow cavity tested a hollow cavity by knocking on it uh, the cavity could have been detected the prefect says by no means if when the article is deposited a sufficient wadding of cotton be placed around it besides in our case we were obliged to proceed without noise so since they were uh, searching the apartment illegally uh, they had certain limitations and restrictions that they could not make a noise that is why they could not use that knocking method but they had searched but you could not have removed you could not have taken two pieces all articles of furniture in which it would have been impossible to make a deposit in the manner you mention a letter may be compressed into a thin spiral roll not differing much in shape or bulk from a large knitting needle and in this form it might be inserted into the rung of a chair for example you did not take to pieces all the chairs so the narrator was confused because it was very easy to hide a letter a letter can be rolled into a thin uh, straw like form and be inserted in any of the rungs of the chair so he was really concerned if they had taken apart all of the furniture while in the process of looking for the letter the prefect says certainly not but we did better we examined the rungs of every chair in the hotel and indeed the jointings of every description of furniture by the aid of a most powerful microscope had there been any traces of recent disturbance we should not have failed to detect it instantly 
A single grain or gimlet dust, for example, would have been as obvious as an apple. Any disorder in the gluing, any unusual gaping in the joints would have sufficed to ensure detection. So uh, the prefect tells him how much care uh, and patient, patience they had exercised while looking for the letter. I presume you looked to the mirrors between the boards and the plates and you probed the beds and bedclothes as well as the curtains and the carpets. The prefect replies, that of course, and when we had absolutely completed every particle of the furniture in this way, then we examined the house itself. We divided its entire surface into compartments, which we numbered, so that none might be missed. Then we scrutinized each individual square inch throughout the premises, including the two houses immediately adjoining with a microscope as before. So they had even used uh, very powerful instruments like the microscope for detecting uh, the hiding spot of the letter, but they had still failed. The two houses adjoining even the houses next to the house in which the minister used to live, I exclaimed, you must have had a great deal of trouble. We had, but the reward offered is prodigious. It's quite prestigious. You include the grounds about the house. All the grounds, uh, the area around the house are paved with brick. They gave us comparatively little trouble. We examined the moss between the bricks and found it undisturbed. So not only had they searched the house, but they had searched the whole premises. You looked among these papers, of course, and into the books of the library, the narrator questioned. Certainly, we opened every package and parcel. We not only opened every book, but we turned, turned over every leaf in each volume, not contenting ourselves with a mere shake. So they had not just shaken the books to look for the letter, but they had painstakingly, uh, you know, turned each and every page in every book according to the fashion of some of our police officers. We also measured the thickness of every book cover with the most accurate admeasurement and applied to each the most jealous scrutiny of the microscope. Had any of the bindings been recently meddled with, it would have been utterly impossible that the fact should have escaped observation. So they were very thorough. Some five or six volumes just from the hands of the binder were carefully probed longitudinally with needles. So even the spine of the books had been searched very carefully for the letter. The narrator further questions him. You explored the floors beneath the carpets? Beyond doubt. We removed every carpet and examined the boards with a microscope. And the paper on the walls? Yes. You looked into the cellars? We did. Then I said, you have been making a miscalculation and the letter is not upon the premises as you suppose. This was the opinion of the narrator. The prefect says, I fear you are right. And now, Dupin, what would you advise me to do? So this was uh, where the problem had reached because they had thoroughly and very minutely looked for the letter everywhere and they were still unable to trace it. Dupin says, to make a thorough research of the premises. That is absolutely needless, replied G. I am not more sure that I breathe than I am that the letter is not at the hotel. Dupin says, I have no better advice to give you. You have, of course, an accurate description of the letter. Oh yes, and the prefect producing a memorandum book proceeded to read aloud a minute, I'm sorry, minute account of the internal and especially of the external appearance of the missing document. So he had a very, uh, he had a file on the letter itself as to what it appeared to be like. Soon after finishing the perusal of this description, he took his departure. More entirely depressed in spirits than I had ever known the good gentleman before, so even when Dupin does not give him a solution than to re-search uh, or um, to go through the premises again, we find the prefect a bit depressed. In about a month afterwards, he paid us another visit and found us occupied very nearly as before. He took a pipe and a chair and entered into some ordinary conversation. At length, I said, Well, but G, what of the purloined letter? 
I presume you have at last made up your mind that there is no such thing as overreaching the minister. Confound him, say I, yes, I made the re-examination, however, as Dupin suggested, but it was all labor lost as I knew it would be. Now, Dupin Uvea is very smart. He says, how much was the reward offered, did you say? asked Dupin. Because there was a kind of money involved in the whole case and the prefect had mentioned it uh, during his last visit. Why a great deal, a very liberal reward. I don't like to say how much precisely, but one thing I will say that I wouldn't mind giving my individual check for 50,000 francs to anyone who could obtain me that letter. So he was so desperate that he was ready to part with the prize money in order to solve the case. The fact is, it is becoming of more and more importance every day and the reward has been lately doubled. So such was the desperation of that royal lady that she had even doubled the amount of money that she was ready to give as prize money. If it were troubled, however, I could do more I could do no more than I have done. So even if the money becomes triple, there was no other step that the prefect could have taken that he had not taken in the past while looking for the letter. Why, yes, said Dupin drawlingly, between the whiffs of his meerschaum, I really think, G, you have not exerted yourself to the uttermost in this matter, meaning you have still not given your best. You might do a little more, I think, eh? How? In what way? Why? And he's puffing his, uh, you know, smoke. Puff, puff. You might puff, puff. Employ counsel in the matter. He puffs again. Do you remember the story they tell you of Abernathy? No, hang Abernathy. To be sure, hang him and welcome. So Dupin wanted to talk to uh, the prefect about a doctor called as Dr. Abernathy. He says, once upon a time, a certain rich miser conceived the design of sponging upon this Abernathy for a medical opinion. So he went to the doctor for a medical opinion. Getting up for this purpose, an ordinary conversation in a private company, he insinuated or hinted his case to the physician as that of an imaginary individual. So a person wanted an opinion for himself, but he does not say to the doctor that he wanted it for himself. He rather says that, you know, I want uh, your medical advice or opinion uh, regarding so-and-so person. Dupin was actually trying to give a hint to the prefect that there is uh, nothing which is done for free. So that is why he gives the example of Abhinathy. And uh, he further goes on telling him about the story of that man called Abhinathi uh, who was visited by a miser, a person who does not like to part with his money. We will suppose, said the miser, that his symptoms are such and such now, doctor. What would you have directed him to take? Take, said Abhinathi, why take advice to be sure. So when that miser wanted to ask him for an advice, uh, Abhinathi says that yes, uh, he should be taking an advice. Prefect actually gets the point which Dupin was trying to make and he says, but, said the prefect a little discomposed, I am perfectly willing to take advice and to pay for it. I would really give 50,000 francs to anyone who would aid me in the matter, help me in the matter. In that case, replied Dupin, opening a drawer and producing a checkbook. You may as well fill me up a check for the amount mentioned. When you have signed it, I will hand you the letter. I was astounded. This was the narrator who was astounded or surprised. The prefect appeared absolutely thunderstricken. He was even shocked. Uh, for some minutes, he remained speechless and motionless. Looking incredulously at my friend, he was beyond shocked and could not believe his eyes. With open mouth and eyes that seemed starting from their sockets, his eyes were almost popping out from his sockets, an expression of surprise on his face. Then apparently, in some measure, he seized a pen and after several pauses and vacant stares, finally filled up and signed a cheque for 50,000 francs and handed it across the table to Dupin. 
The latter examined it carefully and deposited it in his pocketbook. Then, unlocking an escritoire, escritoire is nothing but a small writing desk uh, which has drawers and compartments, he took thence a letter and gave it to the prefect. This brings us to the close of this lecture session. We'll continue the story in the next one as well.